Hi, and welcome to Codex. Today, we are happy to have Nate Strawn from Georgetown University. Nate and I first learned about frames and wavelets together at an RU way back in 2002. Since then, he earned a bachelor's and master's in mathematics from Texas A&M University. His master's thesis introduced the connection between frame theory and algebraic geometry. His PhD is from the University of Maryland, where his advisors were Codex Seminar alumni John Benedetto and Radu Balan. He held postdoctoral positions at Duke, the Food and Drug Administration, and the Applied Physics Lab before finally joining the math faculty at Georgetown. His research focuses on the use of optimization, geometry, probability, and topology in data science and frame theory. Today, he will be speaking on 3D filament plots from optimally smooth 2D Andrew plots. Take it away. Thank you very much, Emily, uh, and also thank thank uh, your co-organizers, Dustin, John, and Joey. Uh, it's been a really great series of talks, and I greatly appreciate that you guys have taken all that time to organize it and put it together. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, a project that I've been working on since the summer, basically. Um, so the, um, the archive submission just made it onto archive this Monday. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a link to the, um, the preprint um, in, in the talk. There's also code on GitHub and I'll give you that link. Uh, so uh, most of the visualizations that we're really familiar with are lossy visualizations. So for example, the uh, ubiquitous 2D scatter plot. Um, if you have uh, general lowercase d dimensional data and you dump it into two dimensions somehow, even if it's in a nonlinear way, uh, you're going to lose some information. Uh, in particular, you'll lose information about metric distances between points. Uh, the easy thing that you get is that if points are close in data space, they will generally be close in the visualization space, that is, in the scatter plot. The problem is that just because two points are close in the scatter plot does not necessarily mean that they are close in the data space. So that, um, that would come from a different bound uh, that generally falls apart. Um, there are, of course, uh, many different techniques um, that provide uh, you know, very charismatic pictures, especially when you're trying to do um, classification that you believe has some sort of uh, uh, clustering property. Uh, so there's multi-dimensional scaling, uh, where you try to preserve metric distances uh, by dumping in two dimensions. Uh, of course, there's PCA. I, I didn't even mention that, but that's our, our main linear procedure for dumping into 2D scatter plots. Um, uh, T distribution based stochastic neighborhood embedding. Uh, and more recently, there's the UMAP technique. Um, so instead of lossy visualizations, uh, you might try lossless visualizations. Um, so that uh, that's slightly more complicated. You introduce, uh, in quotes, visual entropy. Uh, but you have the possibility of uh, preserving all the metric information of your data set inside of the visualization. Uh, one reason you might do that is, well, if you do uh, any sort of uh, 2D or uh, otherwise lossy visualization, you may be throwing out information that is useful for regression or classification tasks downstream. So one of the first uh, lossless visualization techniques we have is called the matrix of scatter plots. Um, here's an example with Anderson's iris data set. Um, here there are three classes of iris, uh, and it's a four-dimensional data set. So it's just enough dimensionality to where we can't actually look at it in three dimensions or two dimensions. Um, here uh, we plot every single scatter plot of uh, all pairs of variables. So that's often why this kind of plot is also called a pairs plot. So if you go into um, RStudio, uh, you, can, you can call the pairs command and you'll get plots like this on a data set or data frame. 
Um, here, um, we've got sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width. Uh, you could make this a symmetric matrix, uh, but um, the upper half plots are redundant. Uh, it's just the just a flip of um, the lower lower plots. Um, and here you can see uh, that generally, if you pick any two variables, any two distinct variables, you can see the separation between classes after you do a colorization. Uh, this kind of plot was also known as the is also known as the draftsman plot. Uh, um, Tukey called it this. Um, one issue is that as you start jacking up the dimension, um, it becomes very, very hard to read this plot. So already in 12 to 20 dimensions, uh, when you have uh, a 20 by 20 grid of plots, you have to start zooming in to see any sort of behavior. Um, and of course, as you get higher and higher in your dimensionality, uh, it, it becomes even worse. And one of the reasons why it's uh, very difficult to read these plots as you increase the dimensionality is that every single plot contains some piece of information about the data, about a single data point. That is, um, every single square here contains one point corresponding to one data point. So as you increase that uh, dimensionality, well, asymptotically, that means that you're spreading out the information about a single data point uniformly over the visualization space, um, uh, which indicates that you have a high, you're introducing a high amount of visual entropy. Um, so since your data points are co not connected, uh, it's hard to figure out or do a comparison uh, of point to point information. Um, uh, also, uh, this is this is really uh, similar to a small multiples type plot. So small multiples, uh, you have uh, many examples that uh, form a single image, and you plot many images all at once. Um, and when you get, you can do that for about a twenty by twenty grid. Um, but as you start to get uh, beyond, say, 400 examples, then uh, you have uh, less ability to glean important information from, from small multiple plots. Uh, another interesting plot, uh, when, I, when I saw this type of plot first, I thought it was ridiculous. But these are called parallel plots. Um, and it's, it's a very simple idea. You take all the features and you just spread them out evenly along the x-axis. Uh, and then what you'll do is you'll usually standardize each of the features, each of the feature variables. Um, or you could rank it, whatever you like. Um, and then what you do is you just, uh, above each of the features, you plot the value. And then for every single data point, you just connect the dots. Um, and you can see that um, this is actually useful for, say, this four-dimensional data. You can see uh, definitively that, yes, there is some separation of the classes, and I can, I can see how the different variables uh, 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 illustrate that separation. So these came about in 1985. Um, uh, the nice thing is that, uh, in contrast, with the matrix of scatter plots, you now have a single point is connected. So somehow your information about a single point uh, is localized, which is nice. So you can now do point to point, rough point to point comparisons by comparing the spline created by one data point with the spline created by another data point. Um, unfortunately, it, especially as you increase the dimensionality of these plots, they look really unpleasing. It's a very unpleasant look. The reason is you have these really high frequencies that show up because there's no reason why uh, you would expect uh, there to be a nice transition between values in one variable to the next variable, right? The variables don't automatically satisfy some sort of uh, nice one-dimensional smoothness condition just in their native ordering. There are some methods for ordering so that they, these plots are not quite so uh, unpleasant to look at. Um, but in general, you will always have this issue because they're 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 noisy, um, and of course, if you plot a bunch of these points all at once, um, 
well, you have 1D plots in 2D, and so they're all sitting on top of each other. And so if you increase the number of points, then uh, you can have some serious legibility issues. Uh, the next plots that I'm going to talk about are Andrew's plots. Uh, so these actually came before parallel plots. Uh, but the idea is that you're going to map data linearly to sums of different frequencies of sines and cosines. So essentially, you're mapping to partial um, Fourier series. Uh, so here, uh, I'm wrapping the raw four-dimensional data to uh, things of the form x1 plus x2 times cosine 2 pi t plus x3 times sine 2 pi t plus x4 times cosine 4 pi t. It's that simple. Um, and now this plot is nice and smooth. It's got, it's got a little bit more charisma. Um, of course, I can standardize the coefficients. Uh, that makes things a little bit more wiggly. Um, and then, of course, I can, instead of feeding uh, the x1, x2, x3, and x4 uh, to the coefficients of the sines and cosines, I can feed the principal component scores. Um, and that has, that has various properties that we'll, we'll discuss later. So you can, get, you can get different types of plots. And in each of these, you can basically see that things separate nicely. Uh, um, here, here's the general form of the plot. So uh, the plot consists of a map phi from uh, d-dimensional Euclidean space to uh, the space of square integrable functions on the interval 0, 1. And uh, the plot will look like this. Phi x of t will be exactly x1 plus x2 square root 2 cosine 2 pi t. And I just have the square root 2s to normalize things. That's it. But you, you map your d-dimensional data to all these sines and cosines. Uh, so this came about in 1972. Um, uh, you can see that it still maintains a lot of benefits that you have from parallel plots. Uh, the one caveat is that now the features, the individual features and their contribution to the separation of different classes um, is obscured. Um, nevertheless, it's still useful for uh, looking at metric properties or, or clustering type behavior and things like that. So gr gross properties of the data instead of individual feature, feature level properties are still um, observable. Um, and now because you have lower frequency components, right, you essentially forced your uh, data to live in low frequency land, there's less visual noise, right? You don't have, you don't have all these nasty kinks that you have in uh, the parallel plots. The other fun thing, and uh, this was remarked, uh, this, this, this was a note in uh, the 1972 paper, is that it's a linear isometry. So um, you go from d-dimensional Euclidean space to L2. Um, and uh, when you do this, because you're mapping uh, coefficients in one orthonormal basis to coefficients in a, another orthonormal basis, um, you have that the norm in Euclidean space is equal to the norm of the mapping in the L2 space, which is great. Uh, what is not remarked upon in that paper or any subsequent papers, because I don't think uh, that basically only statisticians have really ever looked at these plots, as far as I can tell. Um, uh, there are not many, I don't, I don't know of basically any other theorems or theory uh, of substance after the 1972 paper. Um, but you have these simple bounds that you can suddenly interpret in terms of the graphs of these plots. So um, first you have a L1 lower bound of this. And remember that this L2 norm is the distance between X and Y in the data space. So this means that if points are close in the data space, then that means that the L1 norm between their Andrews plots is also close. Well, what's the L1 norm of the Andrews plots? Well, if you pick two points out here, it's the relative area between the graphs. And that's something that your eye can pick out easily, relatively easily. Um, whereas, of course, the, um, the L2 norm, it's a nice norm, but visually, uh, visually it would correspond to the square root of a volume of rotation of the relative difference 
between these graphs. And that is suddenly much more difficult to visualize. Um, on the other hand, you also have that the L infinity or the, the soup norm between the graphs will control uh, the distance in data space. So that means that if you go to 2.2 curves here, corresponding to two data points, well, you can figure out a bound on their Euclidean distance by measuring their uh, largest relative difference, the absolute value of the largest relative difference. Uh, and that's something that you can visually access. Um, and in general, uh, there, there are a number of uh, visual perception psychology papers that uh, indicate that humans are generally better at, or are more accurate at uh, estimating length versus areas. Um, one issue, however, is that you're still plotting 1D curves in 2D, right? It's still graphs of functions. Uh, and so you, you will always have things plotting on top of each other. And suddenly that becomes very uh, difficult to interpret uh, when you get in to thousands of data points. Um, so here's a new alternative that we're going to introduce in this paper. Um, so uh, uh, in this paper, we'll construct these things which are called optimal 2D Andrews plots. So this is a static image. So let me go over to, um, let me go over to the full image here. So, so that's a static image. Uh, one thing you can get is uh, these 2D plots have a dynamic form. So this is the dynamic form. This is the points uh, moving over time. Uh, so you have a dynamic form and the dynamic form is tracing out these curves for the different data points. Uh, but of course, uh, that, that's the dynamic picture. It's a little hard to read dynamic plots. It's, a, it's mesmerizing, certainly. There's a certain, it's, it's got a certain charisma to it. Um, but trying to glean information from these plots requires a certain amount of visual memory. Um, and you might have a graduate student stare at it for a long time and complain to you, um, but uh, it's not qu quite as useful as you want. Um, these plots where I plot all the points, I still have this problem where I'm uh, putting one dimensional stuff in two dimensions. So it's still hard to read. Um, but you can always add uh, the time axis, right? So if you add the time axis, now you get these plots and you can move them around in a uh, drag to rotate interface, right? So this is all, this is all code I have in GitHub. You, you could run this code that I have in GitHub and get these plots. Um, so those are the optimal 2D Andrews plots and I'll just show you how you construct them. Um, but also, I wasn't quite happy with those plots, especially when I have multiple classes and uh, uh, I have many, many data points. They still manage to get on top of each other uh, and they're still a little bit difficult to read. Um, and so what I can do is I can take those optimal 2D Andrews plots uh, and I can effectively identify them with uh, what, we'll, what we'll call symmetric curvature functions and I can construct uh, one dimensional filaments or, or, or length one filaments, um, which are 3D curves that uh, spread out into three dimensions. Um, and, and I'll use uh, Fernay serre equations to do this. So, so let me show you, um, let me show you the plot, the, the filaments plot. So this is the filaments plot and the drag to to rotate interface. Um, so it's not quite as busy, uh, in particular because I'm identifying uh, these 2D functions. These 2D functions are actually assuming that I'm uh, dumping into spaces of derivatives. This I'm actually dumping almost into spaces of curvature functions. And curvature is a second order property of a curve. So this is incredibly smoothed out, incredibly smoothed out. Um, okay. And there, there are other, there are nice metric uh, interpretations of the isometry property when I dump things into these, into these filament plots as well. Okay. Um, so may, may, may I interrupt briefly to ask you a short question? How? Yes, please. How are you getting 
how are you estimating the curvature from these sampled uh, curves? Are you using some kind of uh, discrete derivative or uh, an integral form? Um, so, yeah, so the, the access that I have to the curvature, um, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll explain all the equations for it later, um, but essentially, in order to generate these curves, it's um, I, I exponentiate, uh, so I map my functions to the Lie algebra over the orthogonal group. I exponentiate that. Um, Down onto the group. And then I exponentiate the I exponentiate the integral of that, sorry, and then I integrate the tangent vector to produce that. Thank you. And so, in particular, I can do direct comparisons, metric comparisons, because I'm already mapping into curvature land. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? So here, here are the main technical contributions that we'll cover. Um, so we're going to let H, script H, denote uh, the Sobolev space. Oh, wait, am I, I'm not sharing this, sorry. OK, so here are the main uh, technical contributions. So I'm going to let H uh, denote the Sobolev space of L2 curves with L2 derivatives. Uh, the first thing that I do is that given a data matrix X, uh, we can parametrize linear isometries phi from Rd into H2. H2 is the Cartesian product of H with itself. So that means I go from D, it's a linear isometry from Rd into uh, 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 vector valued functions, right? Uh, that produce on average optimally smooth curves over the data set. Uh, the nice thing is that once we have this parameterization, it turns out that there are at least, uh, or the, in the generic case, there are D degrees of freedom to this set of optimizers. And so that means that you can squeeze out other nice properties you might want. In particular, uh, uh, we'll show that uh, we can choose a, a particular member from this class of minimizers such that the map X from phi, X goes to phi X of T that is at a particular time slice, um, these maps are uniformly close to projections. So they're almost a projection, um, uh, which is which has a nice visual property um, that I will explain later. Uh, and then finally, we use uh, equations like the Fernet array system um, uh, to take these 2D curves, dump them into 3D space curves, static 3D space curves, um, and there, those isometry conditions, uh, the L1 bound becomes a total relative curvature bound, and the L infinity bound becomes a max of maximum relative curvature bound. Uh, and so looking at a particular picture, that's not entirely useful. But what you can always do is you can center your data and then do the projection, or then do the filaments plot. Um, and then you can at least compare against um, some sort of center point, how far how far you are in your data space. Um, so there's code at uh, my uh, GitHub, eighty pi, and here's the preprint. If you're interested. Okay, so that's the summary. Any any questions before I move on? Will you be explaining the Fernet array system? Yes. I could I could jump ahead to the Fernet survey system because it looks like because that's that's it's pretty fun actually that's maybe the most fun part let's skip ahead to the Fernet survey system da, 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 da. okay um, okay so uh, to start with we talk about a moving frame um, so uh, moving frames help you solve this classical problem of uh, classifying all space curves. Uh, up to translation rotation. Um, and so the idea is that uh, if you have the, the space curve, well, you can use that to capture the uh, curvature and torsion functions, which are the invariants of a space curve. Um, so for us, a moving frame will be a function from 0, 1 into the orthogonal group. Um, it, this might as well be the special orthogonal group. 
Um, and the classic moving frame for an arc length parametrized curve, that is the norm of the tangent is always one. Uh, the, the classic moving frame is u of t is equal to, in the first row, the tangent, in the second row, the normal vector, and in the third row, the binormal vector. So the tangent is, of course, just the derivative of the curve. And we've, uh, by fiat, declared that uh, it's parameterized in such a way that that tangent always has norm 1. Um, the normal is the normalized derivative of the tangent. So you start with the tangent, and then you add in, you add in the normal. Uh, and the normal, along the normal, is your standard curvature. So your curvature, if you're going around in a circle, the normal will always point in to that circle. Uh, and then because you're in three dimensions, you can take a cross product of the normal and the tangent, and you get the binormal. And the binormal, the twisting of the binormal, is the thing that's telling you your torsion. That is, how much twist does your curve have in space? Um, so here's the classic fresnais serre equations. Uh, it re relates the derivative of this moving frame to the moving frame itself. Uh, and it's via multiplication by a, uh, a function over the Lie, Lie algebra of the special orthogonal group, um, where the, uh, the function that lands in Lie algebra uh, is exactly going to give you the skew symmetric thing where this is the curvature function and this is the torsion function of your curve. So that's the classic uh, fresnais serre equ equations. And much like, um, much like things like derivative of f is equal to constant times f, right? the solution is obtained via exponentiation. right? But now I'm doing exponentiation over um, you know, the Lie algebra uh, for the special orthogonal group. So that's it. So what you'll do. Uh, so, so that's that's what you would do to solve this equation. And of course, uh, you need some sort of initial condition. So you specify how where the frame started off with. Um, um, uh, when you're for for us though, we're not going to do this. I didn't want to dump things into curvature torsion land because that it, it becomes a little bit weird. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those 2D Andrews plots, right? Those smooth 2D Andrews plots. And I'm going to identify those with the symmetric curvature functions. So I just pick n1 and n2, uh, which form an orthonormal basis for um, uh, the, uh, the orthogonal complement of the span of the tangent vector. Um, and then I'm going to identify, uh, I, you know, uh, evolve the moving frame according to this equation, where now I've dumped the functions into the Lie algebra, but, accor but according to this form instead. So that means that, in particular, the derivative of the tangent uh, is always some function of these normal, or the, these vectors in the, the, uh, the tangent plane to the, to the curve, or in the normal plane to the curve. So that's what we'll actually do. Um, so jump, jumping ahead, how do you actually solve this, right? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say lambda 1 is equal to the integral of kappa 1. Uh, lambda 2 is the integral of kappa, kappa 2. Um, and then the way you can extract the curve is you solve this integral equation. Uh, well, this is an integral, so all I need to do is really to be able to exponentiate this thing. Um, well, integrating. Uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2 will be easy because I know exactly its form in terms of sines and cosines because of the way I've constructed my map. So I integrate these like that. I know exactly the analytic form for it. Uh, and then in, to solve, uh, to integrate this, I just do numerical integration. Um, and I'm, I'm helped by this Rodriguez formula that tells you how to exponentiate uh, a member of the Lie algebra in closed form. So that's that's how I will generally construct these um, these filaments. Any questions about that? So, Nate, uh, a question: Do these um, anti-symmetric matrices commute for different s values? 
Uh, so you're asking, uh, no, whether that, have, in general. Yeah, whether they commute. Uh, uh, in general, I, yeah, they will not commute. And so you can't use um, you can't use um, the Baker Camp uh, Baker Campbell house door formula for this kind of thing. And in fact, the commutator is uh, you know the higher order commutators are not nice for this either. Uh, so you're really stuck with the and actually, but the Rodriguez formula is actually very simple. Yeah, but that's for, for the case. exponential, right? For the exponential matrix. Yes. Yes. I agree, but so. Are you saying that the integral zero t of that exponential is actually the solution of the Rene and the other fellow oh. system? Well, so uh, the exp of the integral of this is the solution. So that that doesn't require commutativity, right? To and show that. that so, sorry, but that would be a solution if your lambda one, lambda two were constant. functions if they change with this i'm not sure i mean maybe i mean, it's not obvious to me it's a solution but oh no if because uh because here's what happens is that uh set up set up this exponentiation and then just take the derivative right what is the derivative going to give you well um this is a matrix derivative it's going to behave much like uh much like a vector value derivative and what will happen is you'll get the the, the chain rule will give you it's um, the derivative of x, which is just itself still, applied to this thing. Uh, and then you matrix multiply by the derivative of this thing, which gives you exactly um, the kappa 1, kappa 2 matrix, right? So it's just matrix multiplication. And you don't need commutativity to, to ensure that property. OK, OK. Okay. So you're saying the integral zero t of the exponential is a solution. Of well, so, so this is this, so this is the solution to the moving frame system. This uh -huh. thing, the the inside of the integral, um, but that just gives you the tangent direction. You have to integrate the tangent to get the original curve. Okay. So that's why you have that's why you have an outer integral here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna have a look into the preprint. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah. But now, now, Radu, you're making me paranoid, so thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> it's good to be paranoid. It's good to be paranoid. I, okay. I had the same experience whenever I was like 14 years ago. I first taught the OD graded level, OD class in Maryland. That uh, <clears throat> something I saw that was easier than I. Rather, I saw that it was easier than actually turned out to be. So I, I just hope, you know, anyway, okay. ignore, okay. ignore. Very good. Uh, okay, so, so, so this equation is plenty hard already. Um, but so, uh, any other questions about the frenet serre system? Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, aesthetic conditions for uh, not for constructing nice linear isometries from your data space to your space of curves. Um, well, first of all, uh, we'll let a capital X denote a data matrix. Um, so it's uh, in the D by N matrix land. Uh, so it has D rows and capital N columns, uh, whether the data is in columns. Phi is going to be a continuous linear map from RD into H2. Uh, we're going to identify several desirable conditions for phi. First of all, uh, there's a global non-degeneracy condition. Uh, in order to avoid collapsing the graphs, uh, we're going to enforce what we'll call an isotropic isometry condition. So for every single unit vector in the target space of two dimensions, if I take the L2 norm of the function obtained by taking the inner product of U uh, with my vector valued function, um, then I'll recover the norm of X. 
So in any direction I look, I'm an isometry. That's the isotropic isometry condition. There's a local non-degeneracy condition. Um, and that condition entails that uh, the time slice of this map, it will be a scaled projection. So the time slice uh, will be a uh, two by D matrix, real value matrix, right? If I fix a particular time T, it's a two by thing, two by D matrix. And I can just ask, is that a matrix? Is that a projection for every single time slice I can pick? Um, and also, and we'll discuss how, how that leads, how you could have some sort of slightly odd degeneracy if you don't have some condition like this. Um, finally, uh, I want to have those bounds, the L1 and L infinity bounds have some sort of visual interpretation that you can access. Um, and so in order to do that for the 2D curves um, and also to remove certain biases that occur um, if we get outside of 2D um, or, or, or biases that may occur because I have a constant term um, or linear term, we're going to require that phi will map to derivatives of periodic curves. So that simplifies the, uh, the range of this, these maps. And then finally, I'm going to desire a smoothness condition so that the curves that I produce are aesthetically pleasing. Um, and that means that I'm going to minimize the mean quadratic variation uh, of phi given the data x, and that's just simply the mean of the norm square of the derivatives of the individual curves that I get from the different data points. Any questions about these conditions? I'm going to elaborate upon upon these, um, but if there's any any questions right now, I can I can discuss them. Okay, so. Why do we need the isotropic isometry property? Well, if you just dump everything into a single coordinate, you still have an isometry condition for the vector valued function, um, but the resulting curves will be stuck on a 2D plane, which completely obviates the point of dumping things into three dimensions in the first place. So that's why the is isotropic isometry condition is nice. and the uh, uh, the fact that it's completely isotropic is useful because otherwise you'll produce more visual biases. So you force it to have the same type, you know, have the same isometry constants in every single direction. Uh, the next thing is the projective tour property. So I want all the time slices of the phi map to be scaled projections. So what if that didn't happen? Suppose that everybody, all the time slices were rank one. Well, it turns out that if all the time slices are rank one, then you can always represent your uh, uh, your curve in terms of uh, a essentially a coefficient function times some function phi that's stuck for all time. So every single x in your data set will be mapped to one coefficient function, essentially. And uh, it, may can, it, it may hide that very well because this phi may go around space very nicely. Um, but you're essentially restricting um, the variety of curves that you can get from your map uh, if you have this degenerate case where phi of t is always rank one. If you're rank two, you are always ensured that you get two curvature or two coefficient functions. Um, so there, it's a subtle it's a subtle degeneracy, um, but that we can avoid. Uh, the nice thing is that if I am dumping instead of to functions, derivatives of functions, uh, well, the L1 bound becomes uh, uh, interpretable in terms of the length, the relative length of curves. So if you take the two different difference of curves, now the relative length is exactly the L1 norm. Um, the L infinity norm is now the velocity, the relative velocity of the curves. So this is slightly more interpretable once I land in two and three dimensions. Um, whereas areas, uh, the, the soup norm is always relatively easy to interpret, um, but the areas, uh, the L1 norm will be complicated. Okay, um, so 
just a technical exposition. I'm going to fly through this part. Um, so I want a linear map. Uh, I identify linear maps with um, two by D matrices of Sobolev functions. So every single entry is a Sobolev function. So here's a picture to illustrate these kind of functions. So this is uh, this fee is in two by D land. This is a, this function. This top left corner is cosine two pi t. This is cosine four pi t. This is cosine six pi t. This is sine two pi t, sine four pi t, sine six pi t, and they're all arranged in this two by three grid. So when I take a time slice, I'm evaluating each of these functions uh, to obtain a two by three matrix of values. And I'll call the I'll only have two component slices, right? The top component and the bottom component, and then I have three coordinate slices where the coordinates are the things in data space. So those are the things that I'm actually optimizing over, these kind of continuous tensor type things. Again, this is a false plot, right? It's just it's just to kind of illustrate the idea of what these tensors look like. Um, then I'm going to translate all these aesthetic conditions into constraints on these tensors. Um, so uh, the isotropic isometry condition uh, becomes uh, the condition that all the entry, uh, the entry-wise functions of uh, this tensor, have to form an orthonormal basis in L two. The projective tour condition becomes uh, the fact that all the time slices, if you take uh, time slice times time slice transpose, um, you get uh, D times uh, the Kronecker delta function. Uh, and finally, the derivative, being a derivative of a periodic function, you enforce the boundary condition and you enforce the condition that the constant component contributes nothing. So this is the full program. So I, I'm minimizing the mean quadratic variation, that average of the sum of norm square of the functions, subject to all these quadratic and linear constraints. So it turns out, don't do this. It's too hard. What we're going to throw away are is this continuous system of constraints. And if I do that, I get something that's tractable analytically. So here's what the solutions to this program will be. So I just have the isotropic isometry condition, and I'm dumping into derivatives of uh, periodic functions. So first, you get an SVD of your data matrix. Um, and then you look at the principal components, essentially. Uh, so I've got u1, u2, up to ud are the columns of the u matrix. Remember, my data is in columns. Um, then phi will solve the partial MMQV program if and only if there exist unimodular constants, that is, um, uh, the absolute value of the omega k's will all be 1, and wk in minus 1 and 1, such that when I identify r2 with c, phi of x of t is exactly, I'm going to sum k equals d, I'm going to take the principal component, the kth principal component score of x, and I'm going to identify that with uh, omega k, so I spin by omega k, and, and I get to choose omega k. Those are my degrees of freedom. Uh, e 2 pi i omega kt. It's got to look like that. And so in particular, you see that this is a partial Laurent series restricted to the unit circle. Um, and, and the only degrees of freedom that I have really are these omega k's. Um, I can spin it. That's it. Any questions about this? Um, so for example, uh, if you take the iris data set, um, here's the here's the U that you get for the iris data set. X will map to, uh, because you only have four components, it's E to the 2 pi IT, 4 pi IT, 6 pi it, 8 pi it. So that's the standard, that's a that's a map where omega omega k's are all equal to 1, right? So that's simple enough. Um, so the proof sketch, I'm going to, again, zip through a bunch of this stuff since we're running low on time. Well, basically, you um, 
uh, 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 do a vector value discrete time Fourier transform. It diagonalizes this um, the norm square derivative operator. Um, uh, then you can then you can do some analysis on this um, and apply fischer courant to get a lower bound. Uh, and then you can just show that things of this form are the only thing that attain that lower bound. That's the main. That's the main idea. Um, the next one thing is that uh, using uh, using uh, uh, bounds on generalized quadratic uh, uh, Gauss sums, uh, you can also now extract a uh, asymptotic projective tour property. So here's the trick: if you set omega k equal to this, so e to the two pi i k squared over four d for k equals one to d. Um, then the slices, if you normalize them properly by the same constant, they all have singular values uh, roughly within uh, one over square root or fourth root of D of one. So they're very close to being, uh, to being projections. They're not quite projections, but I'm pretty close. Uh, and as D increases, uh, I get better and better proximity to uh, satisfying this condition. So even though I've dropped the uh, projective tour constraint because it was too hard, I can still slightly recover it. Um, so here's an example with the iris data set. Um, the blue lines are the singular values for um, the slices of this original map. And you see how those crash to zero, right? The, the lower singular value crashes to zero. Um, the green is where I've done these quadratic phase shifts. I've picked out that member that exhibits the quadratic phase shift. And those are controlled, right? And it's only in four dimensions you see that this is not so bad. And as you jack up the dimension, this, this plot gets even better. Um, so the proof of the sketch um, is, so there's this trick where um, you can show that a tight frame of R2, or a frame is tight in R2 if and only if, uh, when you do the identification of the vectors with uh, the corresponding complex numbers in the complex plane, if you sum the squares, you get zero. Well, you can relax that to a perturbative condition, right? So you instead, this, you have sum on z squared is equal to w squared. Um, if w squared is small, then the singular values of the F matrix, the frame matrix, have to be close to one or close to each other. Uh, and then what we can do is we can invoke uh, relatively recent uniform bounds on generalized quadratic Gauss sums um, of this form. Uh, and then of course, we have to multiply this all by, um, you know, two over D in the long run. So that's how we get a one over square root D type behavior. Um, uh, but this, this is, uh, the, the actual asymptotics of this had already been uncovered by Hardy and Littlewood uh, but I wanted a quantitative form because I wanted to show that the constants, at, the constant is not incredibly large. The constant here is relatively small for the, the asymptotic scaling. Okay. Um, uh, so another thing that the, uh, another thing, if you, if you redo the proof of theorem one, you can show that um, the mapping of PCA coefficients to sines and cosines uh, produce, produces these optimally smooth maps. So, so this gives a justification, one justification for the statisticians using uh, PCA scores instead of raw data or raw features for these Andrews plots. Um, you can also repeat this in three dimensions, but there's, uh, it's not quite as elegant. Uh, the main thing is that in uh, the differential operator uh, has these you know, shift invariant eigenspaces of dimension two. And so uh, in two dimensions, because you're doing the vector valued map, you're essentially doubling the, uh, uh, you're doubling the number of um, each singular value, right? They, they somehow gain multiplicity when you do the vector valued map. So you essentially map one uh, principal component to one frequency via this identification. Um, Another sad thing is that the bounds L1, L2, and L infinity have this, uh, in particular, the L infinity bound has a square root D gap, which is not great 
Um, ideally, you would be able to dump into L infinity and squeeze that bound maybe at the price of having more noisy functions. Um, on the other hand, if you just want to preserve uh, distances between data, well, we know from the johnson lindenstrauss strauss transform that you can dump in uh, points of data into O log n dimensions. And so that means that this L infinity bound, right, the gap is only O of square root log n. So if you just want to compare data, then you might be fine. You know, the scaling is not as bad as the square root D would suggest. Uh, we covered this. Um, hyperframes. Oh, I'd, I'd love to get to this, but maybe you guys can go through it. But basically, um, when you go to discrete land, um, uh, the problem, the constraints on the problem uh, entail this hyperframe condition. So a hyperframe is a superframe. So it's a Parseval superframe. And basically, Parseval superframes are superframes that satisfy the isotropic isometry condition. So there's a connection between these conditions in finite dimensional land. Um, but also where each of the slices is a fusion frame, right? The projective tour constraint is essentially like you're, you're trying to construct a fusion frame, almost like a continuous fusion frame. Um, and so if you wanna, uh, ideally when, you know, with the, with the possibility of doing direct dumps into three dimensions, this is something interesting to look at. Here's a nice complex characterization of planar hyperframes, uh, which may be of interest. Um, conclusions. Um, uh, again, uh, you can uh, dump finite metric spaces into L infinity isometrically. So this, this is known. Um, but for our purposes, it would be really nice to be able to dump into L infinity functions over R2, R3. <coughs> or since you're trying to dump into spaces of curves, um, you know, what you really want to do is you want to dump spaces of curves in such a way that data point, the distance between data points is preserved by uh, Hausdorff uh, distance between the two curves and three dimensions. Uh, and we would love to do this for closed curves, um, uh, but uh, our, our technique where we, uh, we take curves and we dump them into curvature or symmetric curvature functions or curvature functions slash torsion functions, uh, that becomes complicated when you want to get a closed curve because of the closed curve problem. So the closed curve problem says uh, which curvature and torsion functions uh, or what are necessary and sufficient conditions on curvature and torsion functions such that the resulting curve is periodic. So actually, that's an incredibly hard problem. There is some pres uh, partial resolution uh, for the two-dimensional case, uh, but the three-dimensional case is uh, the Wild West. All right, that's it. Any questions? Oh, and I've got more plots. Sorry. Uh, while we're doing questions, I'll go through the additional plots because they're so pretty. All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, thank the speaker so we can stop the recording, smash that reaction button. Thank you, guys. Thank